A two-moon public housing residential flood struck by lightning. The government to give conditional job offers to certain university students. And the U.S. debt ceiling bill passes the House of Representatives with broad bipartisan support. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Amid the amber rainstorm warning issued by the Hong Kong Observatory this morning, lightning struck a flat at Walton Estate in Tu Moon. No one was injured, but part of the flat's exterior concrete was damaged. Veronica Lin tells us more. From 4 a.m. to 9 a.m. this morning, Hong Kong recorded more than 23,000 cloud-to-cloud lightning strikes and at least 12,000 cloud-to-ground lightning strikes. As if in a movie, a lightning bulb struck the 27th floor of the building at Wong Tin Estate in Chun Moon. It damaged part of its outer concrete. We got in touch with the tenants of the unit that was struck by lightning. Nepalese resident Guru Prati, who was with their daughter at the time, said she saw it even with the curtains closed. It's very scared. Well, my daughter said, I don't want to sleep here. Well, I don't want to enter this room. I was just combing my daughter's hair for uh, ready for the school. Oh. Fire, yeah. boom, like fire. Some meteorologists said the paths of lightning strikes are highly random and easily affected by charged particles in the air. Long Wing Mo, former assistant director of the Hong Kong Observatory, explained the air in the atmosphere is not entirely homogeneous. Some places are more likely to have ionized air, leading to a zigzag-shaped lightning path. And that led to the unlikely event of a lightning bulb striking one of the apartments this morning, he said. Lang added that each technology has its limitations, even for lightning protection equipment. He wants residents to not over-rely on them. He emphasized that the buildings nowadays are very safe and that residents are recommended to stay at home during thunderstorms. However, it would be best to avoid staying too close to windows. The Hong Kong Observatory issued the Amber Rainstorm Warning, which remained in force for almost three hours this morning. Among the districts, Tu Moon and the island of Peng Chau recorded the most rainfall at 50 and 70 millimeters, respectively. Fran Kalin, TVB News. Starting this year, the government will give conditional job offers to certain university students who have not yet graduated. The Civil Service Bureau says the measure will benefit the government, the city's universities and the students themselves. Tim Zili tells us more. Secretary for the Civil Service Ingrid Young today met with representatives of eight subsidized universities to explain the government's latest job offers. Starting this year, the government will give conditional job offers to third-year university students or those about to enter into their third year of university education. Conditions of acceptance include the individual completing their studies within a designated time frame. The government will begin its recruitment drive this September. University graduates of 2024 and 2025 could apply for civil service jobs such as administrative officers and executive officers too. Other government departments, such as disciplinary forces, could also widen their hiring range according to issues such as manpower shortage. Civil Service Chief Ingrid Young said the updated hiring policy would benefit three parties, the government, the universities, as well as the students. She added that letting young people join the civil service earlier would allow them to plan out their career paths at a younger age. As the SAR recently lost around 5.9 percent of its civil servants, Young stressed that even with the new recruitment policy, the civil servant shortage problem will not be instantly solved. Some university students share their opinions on the new measure. This student said it is a good thing that young people could have such opportunities before graduating from university, and that it would give them ample time to find out if the profession suits them. This student, on the other hand, said he is not interested in the civil service, and he does not find the new measure attractive. The government said it will contact the various universities to brief students on the new recruitment policy. Timothy Lee, TVB News. 
The Office of the Privacy Commissioner for Personal Data released an investigative report today on unauthorized access to credit data by a technology company. The Privacy Commissioner Ada Chung said this amounts to a violation of the Personal Data Ordinance. The Mo Zangai reports. In the digital era, companies can obtain personal information from individuals without much hassle. However, such information is not always obtained in a transparent way. Local technology firm SoftMedia has come under scrutiny from the Office of the Privacy Commissioner for Personal Data. SoftMedia operates the TE Credit Reference System, a database that contains the credit data of about 180,000 borrowers with about 680 money lending companies using the system. On SoftMedia's website, the company said its database is the largest in the city. Nonetheless, the PCPD earlier received a complaint from a man who said his credit data in the system was assessed many times by eight unknown money lending firms without his approval and knowledge. One firm even checked his data three times within a week. Privacy Commissioner Ada Jung said the company had weak security measures in place. Soft media allowed unlimited access to the credit reference system at a very low fee. Essentially, when the money lender paid $2, the money lender would be, would be having unlimited access to the credit reference system for five days. Moreover, the firm also retained more than 50,000 credit records of people who took out loans who had completed their repayments over five years ago. After the PCPD's investigation, the department concluded soft media had violated the personal data ordinance and ordered the firm to take six steps to address the matter within three months. Among them are imposing policy to restrict the amount of times that money lenders can assess borrowers' information. Zhong hopes the operation and management of credit reference databases can be supervised by financial laws or regulations in the future and described the current situation as undesirable. To protect individuals' credit data, the PCPD suggests operators appoint data protection officers to track compliance with the personal data ordinance as one of the preventive measures. Memos and I, TVB News. A divided U.S. House of Representatives passed a bill to suspend the 31.4 trillion U.S. dollar debt ceiling on Wednesday, with majority support from both Democrats and Republicans. The bill now passes to the Senate. Matthew Bray reports. The yeas are 314, the nays are 117. The bill is passed. Without objection, a motion to reconsider is laid on the table. The Republican-controlled House voted overwhelmingly to pass the Fiscal Responsibility Act and send it to the Senate, which must enact the new measure and get it to President Joe Biden's desk before the Monday 5th deadline. The measure, a compromise between Biden and House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, drew opposition from 71 hardline Republicans. That would normally be enough to block partisan legislation, but 165 Democrats, more than the 149 Republicans who voted for it, backed the measure and pushed it through. This is fabulous. This is one of the best nights I've ever been here. I thought it would be hard. I thought it'd be almost impossible just to get to 218. Now I found there's a whole new day here. We've woken them up. Maybe they listen to our speeches. I don't know. We can't keep doing the same thing to solve the problem. We have to think differently. And we can't do it with just one party. We are all in this together. The legislation suspends, in essence, removes the federal government's borrowing limit through January the 1st, 2025. The timeline allows Biden and Congress to set aside the politically risky issue until after the November 2024 presidential election. It would also cap some government spending over the next two years, speed up the permitting process for certain energy projects, claw back unused COVID-19 funds and expand work requirements for food aid programs to additional recipients. Biden called the deal good news for the American people. A similar bipartisan effort will be needed in the Democrat-controlled Senate. Senate debate and voting could run into the weekend if any one of the 100 senators tries to delay the passage. Matthew Bray, TVB News. 
Former U.S. President Donald Trump is facing more challenges for the 2024 Republican presidential nomination. According to sources familiar with the matter, former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence and former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie are planning to enter the race next week. Meanwhile, Republican Florida Governor Ron DeSantis completed his first full day of campaigning in the state of Iowa on Wednesday. Daniel Rao tells us more. Three sources familiar with the situation told Reuters that former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence is set to enter the race for the Republican presidential nomination on June 7th in the early nominating state of Iowa. A staunch social conservative who stood by Donald Trump throughout his time in office, Pence has increasingly distanced himself from the former president since his election defeat. Pence has stated that Trump's encouragement of the rioters who attacked the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021, put him and his family in danger. He incurred the former president's wrath by refusing to support his effort to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Still, Pence has continued to embrace many of Trump's policies while portraying himself as an even-keeled and consensus-oriented alternative. Meanwhile, sources say 60-year-old former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie will officially launch his campaign in the early nominating state of New Hampshire next Tuesday. It will be a second shot at the White House after his 2016 presidential campaign failed to gain traction. Christie has urged his party to move on from Trump's baseless claims that the 2020 election was rigged. Both Pence and Christie's criticism of Trump is likely to alienate the former president's powerful support base as he sits far ahead of his challenges in opinion polls. His closest rival is Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who entered the race last week. DeSantis completed a whistle-stop tour through Iowa on his first full day of presidential campaigning on Wednesday. He gave a series of speeches talking up his efforts to push Florida farther to the right and questioning the direction of a GOP that continues to be dominated by Trump. There's so much more that we'll do, and we'll be outlining a lot of important stuff over the coming months. But here's the thing. You can't do any of this stuff if you don't win the election. There is no substitute for victory. And we need to dispense with the culture of losing that's infected the Republican Party. Dunnerwell, TV News. Still ahead? Russia launches a fresh aerial bombardment on the capital of Ukraine. Wildfires burning out of control in Nova Scotia, Canada, prompting air quality alerts in parts of the U.S. Northeast. And giant rubber ducks are set to go on a two-week display in Victoria Harbor near Tama Park. Welcome back. Russian forces began the new month with a fresh aerial bombardment on the Ukrainian capital, killing at least three people and wounding ten more. This, as the White House announced on Wednesday, the latest in a series of eight packages for Ukraine worth up to 300 million U.S. dollars. Tracy Furness reports. There have reportedly been 17 Russian drone and missile attacks in Kiev in May, and June began no differently with a fresh bombardment. Russian forces hit Ukraine's capital in the early morning with ground-launched missiles. Ukraine reported that its air force intercepted all 10 missiles, which it identified as short-range ballistic Iskander missiles launched from Russia's Bryansk region. An 11-year-old girl, her mother and another woman were killed in the missile strike early on Thursday with more wounded. The casualty toll was the most from one attack in Kiev in the past month. The attack also damaged apartment buildings, a medical clinic, a water pipeline and cars. Meanwhile, this dash cam shows part of a missile falling onto a road in front of a car earlier this week in Kiev. The car just kept on going. In response to the increase in Russian attacks in Kiev and across Ukraine, the White House announced the latest in a series of aid packages, including up to 300 million US dollars worth of air defense systems, ammunition and other defense equipment. We will use that package that we're announcing today to provide Ukraine with additional munitions for Patriot air defense systems, uh, which Ukraine has been deploying quite effectively. Uh, as well as more Avenger air defense systems, Stinger anti-aircraft systems, and ammunition, of course, for the HIMARS, artillery, and anti-armor systems that the United States uh, continues to provide to Ukraine. 
Meanwhile, Russian officials say five people were wounded by Ukraine shelling overnight in the border town of Shebekino. Apartment buildings and residents were damaged, said the regional governor on a telegram post. Ukrainian drones also hit oil refineries in what Russia says is an uptick in attacks on Russian territory. According to reports, too, the last combat ship of the Ukraine naval forces was destroyed this week at the port of Odessa. Tracy Furness, TVB News. Germany is shutting down four out of five Russian consulates by revoking their licenses. The move comes after Moscow limited the number of German officials in Russia to 350. A foreign ministry official in Berlin said the measure was intended to create parity of personnel and structures between the two countries. Russia recently said only 350 German officials, including those working in cultural bodies and schools, can remain. The new move reflects the low in relations between Moscow and Berlin since the invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. Rare wildfires are burning out of control for a fourth day in the Canadian province of Nova Scotia in the, on the Atlantic coast. Some 18,000 people have been evacuated so far and the fires are threatening communities on the outskirts of Halifax. Arid conditions and winds gusts of 25 kilometers an hour hampered firefighting efforts on Wednesday. Firemen have been battling the blazes, dubbed the Tantalan Fire and the Bedford Fire, northwest of the provincial capital, Halifax. The Tantalan Fire has so far damaged around 200 homes since it began on Sunday. The fires have also prompted air quality alerts in parts of the U.S. Northeast. Back locally, the Competition Commission found two major food delivery platforms in Hong Kong may have violated the competition ordinance with their restrictions on partner restaurants. After the situation came to light, the two delivery behemoths have pledged to relax the relevant clauses. During the pandemic, delivery platforms have grown more popular among citizens and eateries. Now the combined market share of two delivery giants, Deliveroo and Food Panda, tops 90 percent in Hong Kong. And the reliance has come with a price. The Competition Commission received three complaints against the platforms and looked into their alleged monopolistic practices. Partner restaurants using their app are charged some 30 percent commission fees per order. Those who signed exclusive agreements can pay a lower commission rate. But that means these eateries can't switch and register their service on other platforms, or they'd be asked to recover the discounted commission fees. The watchdog found some restaurants were asked to pay back half a year worth of commission. Deliveroo would even terminate some eateries' contract. After discussions with the watchdog, both Food Panda and Deliveroo decided to let partner restaurants register on new or smaller platforms without losing their commercial rewards for exclusive cooperation. When eateries are found to have flouted the exclusivity clauses, the platforms can't ask them to pay more than two months' worth of commission. Food Panda will also remove its bundled pickup and delivery service for restaurants. Restaurants welcome the relaxation of clauses and hope the 30 percent commission rates could be lowered. The commission is quite high now. We're not exclusive with one of them. We have we use two of the different companies. So I think reducing that's going to help a lot, to be honest, yeah. The lower commission, it makes it more attractive for the restaurants to use their service. The costs will be down a little bit, so it'll pass on to the consumer as well. It benefits everybody. The Competition Commission says pledges from the two delivery platforms should be able to allay concerns on their anti-competitive behaviors. As the watchdog's public consultation work has begun, citizens could submit their comments and suggestions to the Commission by June 15th. The two platforms' pledges will last for three years, but the pledges will be void when each of their market share in Hong Kong plunges below 30 percent. Two giant rubber ducks are set to go on a two-week display in Victoria Harbour off Tama Park on June 10th. The two inflatable ducks tested out the waters at Ching Yi last week. From next Saturday, the duo will be stationed near Tama Park as well as the Central and Western District Promenade. Organizers said the yellow rubber ducks will be on show for around two weeks depending on the weather. And starting today, duck patterns can be found at 18 MTR stations. MTR MOT station will also transform into a double duck station. Masterminded by Dutch artist Florentine Hoffman, the yellow rubber duck has graced the waters of Australia, Brazil and more. It made its first appearance in Victoria Harbour a decade ago and was seen by some 8 million local residents and visitors alike. And that's the news. Thank you for watching.